Robert Urbis. I'm a senior security consultant for IOActive. So I'm going to be talking about uh, malware as it pertains to Android devices. Um, specifically, we're going to be looking at how you can use uh, an Android device with malware uh, in, a pen, in a pen test scenario. Um, a lot of this is based on some work that we did uh, a number of months ago where we were uh, looking at testing a, an application store. Um, so you end up getting into the question of, okay, there's a particular scenario uh, where you have some unique constraints where the vector is not a traditional uh, vector of, of attack or even uh, getting into a, into a system. So what we ultimately look at is the, the Android applications themselves become the vector and how you manipulate those and how you can, uh, how you can try to get uh, some malicious behavior past some sort of detection engine of, of an application store that's trying to defend itself um, from, or basically defend its users. Um, so we basically came up, uh, developed a framework that allows us to uh, create uh, kind of arbitrary malware from different devices, or for uh, different things that we wanted to test. Yeah, so the reason why this is important is because uh, people are looking at bringing devices, organizations are looking at allowing people to bring their own devices into their organization. And that's pretty much a new vector of attack. Uh, so they're concerned about the risk associated with that. Uh, what applications are on these devices? What sort of permissions are on them? Um, there's different levels of how trustworthy an organization is. You know, is an organization going to insist on installing a piece of software onto a device before it's allowed on the network? Um, and are users going to be, are users going to allow that? Uh, so the talk is basically looking at that scenario where we're allowing, where an organization has allowed uh, a device to come into its organ, come into its kind of security perimeter. And how do they evaluate? Uh, and they want to evaluate the security of their defenses because they're not just going to say, okay, your device can connect to our Wi-Fi, which is our internal network. I mean, I hope that's not the case. It probably is in some scenarios. But uh, so they have, to, they have to have some way of actually developing a, a security posture, a security model. So using malware to look at that security model is a matter of testing it. Um, as far as security, security is a process. Uh, it's something that you do and you look at and you look at it over and over and over again. Um, testing is, is, one, is part of that process. So using, uh, developing custom uh, malware, malware for this particular scenario and a particular threat vector is what we're looking at. Uh, so developing the uh, specific attacks against an organization and using Android as that, as that means. So if I have a policy that says that you're not allowed to uh, take photos with your phone and that there's some way that I'm trying to enforce that, uh, how do you know if that actually works? Well, you try to get an application that's going to take photos and upload it out. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. So it's validating your assumptions. Uh, for this first part, uh, we're going to be talking about Android malware for pen testing. Um, in terms of the, the presentation style, I have a lot of stuff that I can talk about and I can talk a lot and I'll probably talk about more things than I should. Um, but I don't want it to be uh, just me blabbing at you. Uh, I don't like PowerPoint in spite of the fact that there's PowerPoint right there. Um, I don't think it's particularly interesting. Um, so I very much welcome people to interrupt me and to talk about it and just to have us talking about whatever we want to talk about and wherever it happens to go. Um, so the overall... I mean, that, that pretty much says what this is going to be about. Uh, I'm going to be talking a lot about the Android infrastructure um, with the idea that we're going to be getting into uh, what the, and pretty much the environment that we're working in. So what, how, do, how do Android applications work? Uh, what are the main components of them? How, do, how does uh, software get developed for it? And it's all going to be fairly, uh, pretty high level. And then we're going to start talking about specific scenarios, uh, the pen test itself that we're interested in in terms of how we can use malware uh, in, that, in, in that particular scenario. So who am I? Uh, my name is Robert Urbis, uh, senior, secu uh, senior security consultant. Yep, still that, um, for IOActive. Uh, I've been with IOActive for about eight months now. Uh, before that, I did about five years for the Idaho National Laboratory. Uh, my, my specific focus in terms of the things that I've done the most of is looking at embedded devices and uh, industrial control system security. Uh, but I've also spent quite a bit of time looking at uh, Android stuff as well. Um, a lot of it has been incidentally in that space. So looking at uh, people who want to bring uh, mobile devices or Android into a highly secure, highly uh, 
risk, a high risk environment. So if somebody wants to control their process, uh, their chemical process or something from their iPad, basically. So that's how I initially got started looking at this stuff. And then uh, once it started with IOActive, it's gotten into, into quite a bit more, uh, which is what we're going to be looking at, kind of discussing today. So I've defined the target audience as a malicious defender. So I think that the absolute best way to test your security or to even know anything about security is to test it. And to be able to test it, you have to have a malicious perspective. Um, I think red teaming and trying to break things and, 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 and ultimately, uh, that's, that's the only way to know how good you are or how good your security is. Um, you're never going to be 100% secure about everything. Uh, but the best you can possibly hope for, I think, is that you can know where you're not secure or what you don't do right. Um, and then you can basically mitigate those things via other, other vectors. Um, so that's pretty much what we're going to be talking about. Uh, why specifically Android malware? Um, ultimately, having malware is taking that uh, offensive perspective and, and testing and testing and testing and testing again. Um, and as opposed to specifically custom Android malware is because you don't necessarily, uh, in this particular scenario I'm talking about, uh, which I'll describe in a little bit, um, you, can't, you don't necessarily just trust in the wild malware. Um, so you can get malware that's been defined, that you can find, uh, that's been defined, and that you can find in various uh, places. Um, but if you want to test your own organization, or you want to test a, a client's organization, or you're just curious about it, um, the idea of malware and obfuscation means that unless you really have a good feeling for what that piece of malware is, you don't want to just be throwing it at somebody. Um, you don't want to just be putting it on a network because you don't know what it's going to be doing. Uh, of course, there's ways to figure out what it's going to do and you can reverse engineer it and, and that sort of stuff. Uh, but that takes time and sometimes you don't have time. Um, but it's also a lot easier just to say, I know this only contains these things because I built it. So I, I built this malware, I know what it is, I'm going to submit it and I'm going to use it as part of my pen test and that's, it's, it's a lot more uh, cut and dry. Um, so. Doing that leads into a couple of different things, uh, different ways that you can use Android malware. Uh, the one that I'm going to be talking about specifically is a bring your own device scenario. So organizations that pretty much say, uh, we want to allow our employees or users of our system to walk into the uh, environment, our secure environment with their phone. Uh, we're going to allow them to use their phone on our networks. We're going to allow it to talk to our email servers. We're going to allow them to do whatever that, you know, whatever it is that, that uh, the user wants to do. Um, so a big part of that is having an idea of what you want to allow it to do. Uh, so just having a device on your network is not really a great idea. I don't know of any organization that uh, cares about security that just allows uh, devices carte blanche on their network. Um, but so you have some sort of policy that says that I'm allowed to do this and I'm allowed to do that. Uh, what, how do you actually test that? So again, security is a matter of, of process and a matter of testing things. How do you know that your policy uh, not allowing cameras in your environment is actually being enforced. And can you enforce that? And then how do you test that it's actually being enforced? Another interesting one is actually looking at uh, both app stores and uh, malware detection engines. So you want to be able to, to develop custom Android malware for that scenario. Um, and then, of course, proving to management that uh, just because the CEO wants to come into your environment and, and uses you know, whatever device, uh, showing them the bad things that can happen and why you want to be careful or why they might want to be careful. Um, and then ultimately just validating security products. So if you're uh, going to be purchasing something that's supposed to defend you, you want to know, I want to know, uh, how good it is and what it's actually capable of doing. So developing your own stuff is a way of explicitly testing those specific, thing, specific things. So we're going to be talking about the environment that we're in. Uh, by a show of hands, who is familiar with Android and how it works? Okay, so this will be a review for about half of you, uh, and that's okay. Uh, you can correct me if I make any uh, egregious mistakes. Um, so it's mostly open source. Uh, it runs apps within a virtual machine called the Dal Dalvik virtual machine, which is similar to the Java VM, but it's optimized. Um, and the overall uh, device structure looks like this. I don't know how well you can see that. But basically, you have applications at the top, which are written in, in Java. Uh, beneath that, you have a framework and libraries, which are two separate layers, but they're kind of, there are some places where they uh, integrate. Um, and basically, I'm calling uh, the interfaces to those things are the Android SDK, the software development uh, kit, and the Android NDK, the native development kit. 
Um, and this gets into uh, kind of how the applications written in Java interface with Android itself and the, the things that Android provides. Uh, one interesting thing about some of the libraries is that, well, actually, before I get to that, I'll talk about the bottom layer in red is the Linux kernel. It's basically a slightly modified Linux. Um, and there's a number of binary blobs in terms of uh, drivers. And a lot of the drivers are proprietary. Um, they're things that are sold by the radio companies. Uh, and you never get to see what's in them unless you want to reverse engineer that binary, assuming that you can get it. Um, but there might be some open source drivers uh, or other things that are included or even released by Google, say. Um, but not everything is explicitly just Linux or explicitly just a standard JNI interface. Um, sometimes you have things like Bionic, which is what uh, Android uses for uh, its standard C library instead of doing like a glibc or a, a, a micro libc. Um, so there's, there's some slight differences, uh, which I'm not going to be getting into too much, but that's pretty much it. Uh, I would be happy to suggest to Android that they use the term layer cake for their next uh, release, since L is next one uh, after KitKat. Uh, so the SDK itself, uh, it's just like the .NET. It's very similar to a .NET type framework where you have a lot of managed code. Um, there's a lot of example APIs and patterns that you can use as far as developing stuff. Uh, if you, every, it's, it's incredibly easy to develop applications for this environment, to, to have buttons on the screen and, and access uh, the, the uh, features that a phone might provide to you uh, in terms of like GSM location, uh, cell phone information, um, and you name it, there's examples for how to do it. Um, and then, of course, an API layer. Um, then you have the NDK, which is basically um, ways of integrating uh, lower level C level code and C++ level code, or even native code, uh, with the, the higher level Java application. Ultimately, everything has, anything that has a user interface has to have a high level in a, uh, Java application. Uh, you can have services that run um, within the Android environment, uh, even native services, I believe. Um, but ultimately, if it has a user interface or it has any sort of interaction with the user, it has to climb up to the Java level. So this, the NDK is a way of accessing lower level things uh, and services and even uh, frameworks that you want to provide uh, for performance reasons or whatever and, and still providing that to the higher level Java application. A uh, big example of this would be like graphics libraries. Uh, you can bundle in a graphics library that's written in C. Uh, it's very high performance, but you want to be able to utilize that from your Java application or maybe launch and switch to that application uh, or that library from the Java code. Um, even with yeah, native code, everything gets packaged into APK. Um, and ultimately, that native code is still restricted to the same types of things that any other Android application is restricted to. And that's handled by the Linux kernel itself in a way that handles uh, user IDs and application IDs. Um, and the restrictions that are that have been placed upon that device, and that becomes important when we're looking at what uh, malware can do in terms of if you're going to hide malware in a native library, uh, what does that piece of code have access to? What is it allowed to do? And that's all enforced by uh, the lower level an Android uh, kernel. So this is getting into this is horribly hard to see. I'm thinking um, it's basically just an example of a JNI call. Uh, how many of you are familiar with JNI, the Java, Java native interface? Okay, so I think it is incredibly ugly um, just in terms of how you actually interface, uh, but it's, it's ultimately straightforward, uh, if a little verbose, uh, in terms of how you would call and expose C code or C++ code to a Java application. And it's exactly that, it's just fairly standard in that regard. Um, the important thing on this slide is that you can do things in standard C that, uh, like opening files, which is the big box here, you're just opening a file and, and reading from it and writing to it. Uh, and the bottom example, it says in sock FD, it's just opening a socket. You can do that stuff in native code, but if you want to do that stuff in native code, you still have to have the higher level Android permission to allow you to do that. So in the top example, even though we're doing this in native code, we still have to, even though we're opening a file in native code, we still have to have a write external storage permission uh, in our Android manifest. Um, and the bottom one, if we're going to open a socket, we still have to have the permission internet permission in our manifest so that when somebody installs this application, it says, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, and you know it's going to do X, Y, and Z, and you can't really get away with that. Uh, there's no good way to get away from that. Android is actually fairly good at, at maintaining those permissions, and you say what you're going to do, and if you don't do that, then... 
Um, then getting into the VM itself, uh, it's register-based as opposed to a stack-based machine, uh, primarily for speed. Um, the, it runs on Dalvik bytecode, which is translated from regular Java bytecode. So anything that you can write in Java, basically, you can put onto an Android device. Um, and as of 2.2, it actually has a just-in-time compiler as well. So everything's not pre-compiled, per se. It's actually done on the fly. Uh, looking at the kernel itself, uh, biggest thing is that it's basically a Linux kernel. Uh, after, from 4.0 on, in terms of Android ice cream sandwich, um, it's a 3.4 kernel. Before that, everything before that's a 2.6 kernel. Um, but the user space is a bit different. And primarily, what they, the biggest difference is how they've segregated the file system. So you have explicit like slash system and slash data, and the permissions associated with those things uh, are, are significantly different from standard Linux. Um, and a lot of that, it's also primarily only mounted as read-only. Um, it handles all the process management. Uh, every unique application gets its own process, uh, its own user ID, uh, which cannot be shared. Uh, there are some exceptions with that, where if you're a developer and, and you have the same key, you can say, I want to share my user ID with this other application. But it's all based upon cryptographic signatures, uh, which gets to be really important if you're uh, familiar with any of the uh, I think it was at Black Hat this year where they did the, the big release re with regards to signature vulnerability and key signing. Um, that's, that comes into play significantly there. Uh, and then you have various drivers and stuff. Um, I was going to say one more thing that was interesting about this stuff, but I don't remember. Hopefully I remember later on. Okay, so the actual process of building an application, uh, you write your Android app in Java, your native apps can be you know, written in whatever, and then you compile it. Uh, basically for the, the architecture that you're going to put it on. Um, and then generates class files, it gets translated into DEX files, and then that gets all packaged together with various assets into a APK. Um, and then it basically just runs them. So that's pretty much the process. It's really easy to do, lots of tutorials on how to do it. Um, it's, it's trivial. Um, so if you're going to build something that's not explicitly an app, but is still kind of part of the Android environment, um, you've got device drivers. In terms of installing a device driver, you basically have to have root access to the device itself, uh, which is kind of a given in a bring your own device type test environment. Um, and then, but that's just standard to building any other uh, envir driver for any other Linux environment. It's exactly the same. There's no gotchas as far as I'm aware of. Um, and then you have these things called assets, which is stuff that you want to include in your package, but uh, doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the application itself. And you can pretty much put anything in an asset, absolutely anything. It could be a picture. Um, it could just be you know, a couple of bits. It, it doesn't really matter. You can just include it in. Um, so as far as what the APK actually contains, uh, you've got an Android manifest file. And this is what indicates to the Android system what permissions you're going to use, uh, information about signatures. Uh, it defines to the Android environment how your application gets called, what its entry points are, uh, things of that nature. Um, but the biggest important part, as far as the manifest is concerned, is the permissions and the entry points, which we're going to talk about in detail. Um, and then you have the actual classes file, which is just a, uh, a zipped up, you know, basically a Java class file that's been translated into DEX. Um, you have certificate information at the meta INF file. Uh, then you have resources and, and assets. And I've given lots of opportunity for questions, so is there any comments or questions or anything like that so far? OK. Um, and yeah, that's it. So I'm done with my talk. Uh, just kidding. Um, so we have an idea about the software, uh, but now we've got to talk about malware specifically. If you're going to talk about malware, um, I always have trouble talking about malware because uh, I don't think malware is particularly interesting, um, personally. I know a lot of people that are interested in malware and interested in doing like virus uh, analysis and, and, and are very interested in that kind of stuff. And I don't, I don't have that same sort of uh, call, I guess. Uh, so how, why am I interested in, in it at all? And I think it, it gets to be a very philosophical question. So when you're looking at, at malware, um, well, what is malware? Well, in some sense, you know it when you see it. It's a very famous Supreme Court case talking about pornography. Well, what is pornography? Well, you know it when you see it, and that's how you define it. So in this case, malware, I think, follows very much under the same sort of categorization. Um, but even beyond that, uh, you, can, you can come up with some sort of definition. 
So these are examples of different types of things that would be considered malware in a more traditional sense. Uh, so explicitly, anything that breaks a, the Android security model, anything that uh, runs a local exploit against the Linux kernel or against the Dalvik virtual machine or anything like that, it's explicitly breaking what is Android is defining as a security model. I think it's very easy, easy to call that malware. Um, anything that does something that it says that it's not going to do. So if I have an application that's supposed to be a notepad and it's taking pictures of me every five minutes, that's probably malware. Um, detrimental to the user running the device in any particular way. Um, ultimately, anything that harms the user. Uh, so that could be financial, privacy, um, stealing resources, like for botnets, like doing Bitcoin mining or whatever. I don't know if there's any point to that anymore, but um, I don't know. But then you get examples of things that have been explicitly classified as malware that may or may not be malware. I mean, this and one example is this piece of malware called not compatible. Um, it's, uh, it is explicitly malware and it does do some bad things, but I think the core of what it does is that it allows uh, internal network access from an external source. So basically you can, it, it pretty much just creates a little network bridge between whatever Wi-Fi network your, your device is connected to and over a GSM network. So it's, it's a backdoor into a network. Uh, in some cases that is very bad, you don't want that to happen, especially in perhaps a bring your own device environment, but in some cases it's incredibly handy and it's exactly what you want. So if I'm a network administrator, I can have my phone, just leave it on my desk or I forgot, my, forgot it on my desk and now I can have a way into my network to do whatever I need to do. Uh, you know, one man's back door is another man's back door in a different sense. <laughs> um, but more generically, malware is anything software, script, even hardware, uh, that you don't want on your Android device for any reason. Um, and that becomes extremely important as far as the, uh, the bring your own device environment because it's gonna be based upon policy. And I don't like policy, but that's what it's based upon. Uh, so we'll talk about a little bit about what malware in the wild is and what it looks like. Um, this is from uh, Lookout uh, and they, they produce, they, I mean, it's kind of their job to be talking about malware because they're selling a, a thing to protect against malware. So the more information about malware that they provide, the better for them. And I think it's also better for the community. Um, so they have uh, this nice little chart that says uh, probability of encountering at least one threat of a given type in a seven day period. I don't know what that means uh, in terms of actual anything, but it, we have this nice categorization of different kinds of malware. We have got adware, chargeware, spyware, surveillance stuff, and Trojan. I think it's a pretty good categorization of traditional malware for a general user. Uh, does this matter for a bring your own device environment? Probably not. But it definitely matters in terms of you know, a, a standard user and, and the majority of people in terms of somebody just using their phone. Uh, this is a current top 10, top 12, yeah, top 12 threats. Um, basically, these are pieces of malware that have been identified in the wild, identified in like the Google App Store and various other application stores that do explicitly bad things. So we're going to be looking at one of them, um, which, yeah, Droid Dream. We're going to be looking at Droid Dream to kind of just take it apart and see what it does. So, yes? Did you say all of these are in the App Store? No. Uh, some of these have been identified in the App Store. Um, so like Droid Dream was installed on, uh, was identified in it's either 16 or 160 or something like that. Order of magnitude about 100 different applications at one point in time before it was identified as, as a piece of malware. And then you know, a Google store was notified and they took it down. Pretty much any new class of malware or new class of, of bad thing is gonna be distributed as widely as possible and then people are gonna identify and then pull them all down. So most of these have been identified on, I'd say the Google App Store at one point in time. Um, some of them are absolutely not the case. Like GG Tracker was never on the App Store. It was a drive-by download. So as you're browsing something, you get a little pop-up saying, hey, your device is vulnerable. Download this to secure yourself. And you click download and it installs and now you have your malware on your machine. Um, uh, but some of these were, were at one point on the, on the App Store, not by these names. These are generic names for the class of malware. Um, so looking at Droid Dream, and I don't think you can read that, so. Um, basically, this is a piece of malware that was installed in seemingly legitimate applications like, uh, I mean, the classic one is a bowling application, a bowling game. Um, and it was, okay, identified in 50 different apps. Uh, entry point, it requires the user to actually launch the application before it gets uh, installed. 
And ultimately what it does is that once it gets launched, it tries to run two uh, native uh, exploits against the 2.4 kernel uh, that were identified in Android. Um, so first it does this thing called exploit, which is a specific vulnerability um, in the UDEV event handling of the kernel. The other one, if that fails, it tries against raids against the cage, uh, which um, I don't know if was at one point in time a uh, uh, rooting your device like a jailbreak. Um, but ultimately, it's just another vulnerability in the Linux kernel uh, that exploits the privilege, privilege separation between when it has privilege to install itself and, and before it drops back down. Uh, so if it gets that, it basically gets root permissions. And once it has root permissions, it installs a second piece, which it downloads um, and installs into uh, the system app directory. And it does this surreptitiously. So it's able to bypass the uh, installation framework and the, these are the, the things that I want, these are the permissions that I require and that I'm interested in. Please approve that. It bypasses that whole dialogue by doing it via root access to the device and just installing it surreptitiously and installs it as a service. Um, so that was something that I was, had meant to mention earlier is that applications basically come in two forms. You have uh, this, like a user application that gets launched, you interface with, and then it goes away. And then you have like service providers. So it's an application that gets launched at a particular time and just runs in the background and then defines some handlers that then get called and can, be, can provide services. Um, the bit in red here is something that's, almost inc that's incredibly common in almost all in the wild malware that I've seen is that it'll talk to a command and control server, and when it talks to the command and control server, it's gonna get, uh, send it inf unique information about the device itself. Uh, so the IMEI, the IMSI from the SIM cards, um, and uh, device model, and maybe even SDK version. That's common in absolutely everything. Uh, Droid Dream does this uh, both at the high level, um, and then also once it installs its second part, uh, that little service that runs in the background, it install, it also sends that information back. Um, so the particular uh, device uh, sets up listeners for a couple of Android intents, these uh, events that occur, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit. And then it basically sits there and sets up a little command and control endpoint, like a botnet, and it just waits for commands, can download stuff onto your phone, uh, whatever the, the, the head of the, the master, the, the, the CNC server wants to send it and we'll install and everything's great and fun and happy. Um, I have a question for you. Yes. So what is the method by which these uh, uh, installations occur as groups? Like how does, it, if it's a non root device, how does that get in there in the first place? Uh, in this particular example, it's the third point, it's elevated privileges. So it used the exploit or the rage against the cage, an actual exploit against the Linux kernel that was installed on the Android device to gain root uh, at the Linux level. So that's, that's assuming that you have a device that has these unpatched vulnerabilities. Right. Yep, so that's, that's, what this, uh, that's how this one in particular does that. Um, so then that brings up another interesting point as far as Android's concerned. Everybody has heard of Android fragmentation. Um, basically the idea that different uh, Android phones have different levels of Android running on it, and there's vulnerabilities. Uh, different versions, different handsets have different versions of Android installed. Um, so I've got a Nexus 4, so it has uh, 4.0, whatever the latest one is, because Google supports it, but somebody who goes down to the local carrier store, buys a phone, is gonna have you know, version 2 point something maybe. Uh, or maybe they'll have 4.0, but you know, there's a definite issue in terms of upgrading stuff. So even if, even if Google is, is incredibly responsive or uh, device manufacturers are incredibly responsive in terms of fixing things, um, that doesn't help everybody. So if you're having an environment where people are bringing in their own device, they are bringing in known vulnerable devices into your environment. Um, so even though this is uh, the exploit and Rage Against the Cage stuff has been patched for a very long time, it's not new, it's you know, old stuff, you can still have this type of environment, or you can still have an environment where this is a legitimate attack against the device. Or you might have this device in your environment because uh, the person doesn't have a defense against it. Um, so our actual scenario, we looked at some of the malware. Now we're getting into explicitly custom malware for the bring your own device. Um, so when I'm thinking about bringing your own, own device, I'm looking at, uh, again, the scenario where somebody uh, wants to allow people to use their devices in my, in my networked environment. Uh, I'm gonna be providing them access to resources that's on my network. Um, 
those two kinds of things are sort of key. Uh, other things that we, that we have to mention that are, is not necessarily true in other tests is that we assume that as an attacker that's testing this environment that we have access to a physical device. Like we can install whatever we want to install on that device without having to trick a user, trick a user to install it. Um, so if you're looking at just a, a standard network pen test and you're like, hey, let's use Android. And then you're like, okay, now we've got an Android phone that has some malware on it, great. How do we get that into the environment and how do we get it on the network? That's an entirely different question. Um, so, and that is a valid question and that is a valid thing to test, uh, but that's not really what I'm talking about here. Um, so we have, we have access to a device as, a, as an attacker who's doing this pen test. Uh, we're explicitly putting malware on it and we're putting it into that environment. So what kinds of things are we, can we test uh, just off the bat? Um, we can look at uh, looking at the network service of, of the actual environment, looking at different Wi-Fi access points, uh, different Bluetooth, like Bluetooth keyboards, uh, any sort of Bluetooth sniffing you want to do. Uh, Actually, decrypting all the Bluetooth communication is another issue, but basically gathering information about the environment itself uh, and profiling the environment, um, uh, looking for wireless printers, things of that nature. You can have malware that will do all of those things. And it's just running on a phone, somebody's walking around in the environment, it's just picking all this stuff up. Um, you can actually track physical location, so you can get an idea for where things are. Uh, you can be looking at, um, you know, layout where the, the net network center is, um, yeah. Just generic things like that. Um, then you start getting into network stuff. So you can do bridges like uh, uh, that not compatible, where you're going from GSM or uh, other cellular networks uh, to Wi-Fi onto the secure network and just basically creating bridges like that. Um, and then maybe even looking at USB devices. So taking a Android phone that acts as a USB either host or uh, as a USB uh, slave, and then when that gets connected into somebody's computer in terms of uh, either charging it or whatever, acting maliciously from that standpoint on the network. Um, and then, of course, testing egress filtering policies. So if I'm on a network, what can I actually get out, having an idea of that. Uh, and then, of course, visual and audio snooping, uh, just recording everything. I think the best example of this, uh, this wasn't from an Android phone, and it's not my favorite picture, but this is from the Super Bowl, where they're showing and doing reporting about the... Uh, uh, the super secret first of its kind command center where they're looking at you know for terrorist threats or whatever and you see the wireless access point up on the right and then on the bottom left you see the SSID is Marco and the password is welcome here um, I mean this it's insane uh, yeah it's obfuscated welcome here it's written in leet so that's cool um, the picture that I wanted to get that I wasn't able to find again was one of I think reporting on the Sochi Olympics uh, where you had like different passwords like all over this whiteboard. I think it was a, a BBC reporter inside the command center and it was just, it was obscene the amount of information that was just being displayed. Um, but this is the kind of stuff that you can get. Uh, it's always great to get, uh, to you know, have malware installed on applications but then send pictures back to some sort of command and control server and you get pictures of people in the bathroom uh, looking at their phone and things of that nature. Um, but it's, it's definitely a valid thing. And for sensitive information, that's kind of what you're getting at. So if you're allowing people to bring their devices in, in and you're saying, don't take a picture, you trust your users to not take pictures, um, but do they even actually have any control over that? That's kind of what you're testing. Um, so other explicit means of being bad, uh, arbitrary code injection. So let's say that you have an actual detection mechanism. You, you're paying an organization to look at your malware um, or to look at samples or look at phones or look at applications uh, that make some sort of determination is, is this bad? Do we want to allow it on our network? Uh, things of that nature. Um, so these are just different ways of bypassing that that you can test. So if I want to create a or include a library, um, like a native C library in my application that, I, that has a known vulnerability in it, um, and then I, I just happen to be using that known vulnerable library and I have an application and I, I bring it into your environment, you look at it, there's nothing malicious there, but it just so happens to explicitly give me permission or give the application or give somebody attacking the application a way to get root at any point in time. Um, and that's not something that is actually there at time of check. So it's like a time of check, time of use vulnerability. Um, you can write your own application so that there's no known signature for a bad thing. Uh, it's kind of the obfuscated C code type of thing where you're doing something really, really bad, but you're doing it in a way that nobody's ever done before. Uh, there's no signature for it, but you're, you're basically going to allow yourself to be exploited later on. 
And then, of course, updating mechanisms. I mean, everybody has applications that update themselves. Um, whether or not they go through an official channel to do that, uh, like, that like the uh, Google Play Store or something else is, a, is another question. And then you also get into inter inter interesting things like uh, Angry Birds. Uh, so one of the, I think it was about a month ago, where it was uh, revealed from one of the Snowden documents that NSA is using just application information that developers send information in clear text uh, for their own uses that then they can basically just pick up off the wire and use that as, uh, as a way of gaining information. So hiding, exfiltrating information in the most obvious way possible. Uh, so you have an application that sends photos up to that, that, a photo sharing application. So is it any surprise that the photo sharing application requires network access or wants to take pictures or anything like that? It's not any surprise at all, but it's still malware if you explicitly don't want that type of thing to happen. Um, and so I think that's particularly interesting. Uh, as far as delivery mechanisms, say we're doing on time. Okay. Um, basically looking at, we've got a device already in, under our control. Uh, we can do complete customization. Uh, basically we can do whatever we want to do. Um, we can even take an existing application, uh, either an application that's provided by the environment, like a specific mail application that they want to use, and we can just decompile that and recompile it. And depending on the version of Android that we're using, um, we can even uh, not modify the signature with some of those, uh, I think it was blue, no, it wasn't blue code. Does anyone remember the company that, that revealed that uh, the Android signing vulnerability? I cannot remember the name of it. Blue Box? Yeah, Blue Box. Yeah, so it was the Blue Box stuff. So it basically found a way to modify an APK without modifying the signature. So you can inject any sort of code you want. And there's a couple of variations on it. A guy by the name of Sarek, um, he identified a couple of different uh, means to modify packages without uh, invalidating the signature. So all APKs are, are, are are signed, so you know that this, the contents of it haven't been changed, and that is from a particular trusted source, um, or a source that you trust, uh, and, and there's ways that you can modify that, and if you're dealing with a version of Android that's older, then you can still exploit those things. So you can take a uh, existing application that you, know, you're, you're, you provide to your users to access your infrastructure, and then you can modify that and still get inside of it. Um, as far as the actual runtime process, uh, apps basically get have a have a life cycle, which is very well documented on uh, by Google, and these are just different places. Uh, ultimately, every one of these callbacks that get called in your application are places where you can put your malicious behavior. Uh, on the bottom left, you've got the actual creation of your application. Uh, you get into different states of the application. So, like I've been started, uh, I've been resumed, I've been put in the background, um, I've been explicitly stopped, and I've been destroyed. Um, so you basically define all these, uh, you can define methods for all these different callbacks that will then do whatever you want them to do. Um, so these are all different points where you can launch your, your malicious behavior. Uh, then you also have the matter of launching either uh, something in the foreground as an application or launching something as a service that's in the background. Um, when you're in the background, you basically be looking at registering uh, broadcast receivers. Um, so certain actions will cause the system will, will broadcast to all uh, applications that register for a particular action um, the notification that something has happened and then give that application a chance to handle it. So uh, that's what I'm talking about with uh, broadcast receivers. Um, so an example would be like action boot completed. So if you're going to write a service that launches uh, any time that the phone is started, you basically register yourself to receive the boot uh, completed uh, action intent. And then any time the device boots, it's going to send that. It's going to see that your application has been registered to receive that, and it's going to call your stuff. Um, and basically, you have to define that via the Android manifest. There's no hiding that kind of thing, with the exception of doing a local exploit to bypass the Android security model. Um, and so, let's see. Yeah, and you can pretty much do anything that you want from there. So this is an Android manifest, and you probably cannot see it, but basically uh, we're defining an activity um, that's a network scanner. Um, inside the network scanner, uh, we've registered to receive uh, a couple of different broadcasts. Specifically, we're receiving the boot completed broadcast and a quick boot power, na power on broadcast. So any time that a phone gets booted or any time that uh, gets, you know, your phone is off right now, and then you hit a button and you get the quick boot power on. So quick boot power on just happened. Um, so anytime that happens, it's going to launch this code. 
Um, so you can be very, very explicit about when you launch the, the data that you want to launch and what sort of things uh, happen. And again, uh, it is very, very philosophical as to what you want to do and how you want to do it. Uh, and most of the stuff in terms of developing ma Android malware is a matter of deciding what you want to do and then deciding the best way to do it. Uh, these are just some example of a few of the hundreds of different kinds of broadcast intents. So these actions that get broadcast that you can actually use. These are just the ones that start with A, just the first 20 or so. Um, and there's a lot of different places. Uh, so let's see, one thing that I didn't get into is more of the permission models. Well, I talked a little bit about that. Um, yeah, I think I covered that enough. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways that you can do this. There's a lot of different things that you can test. Um, question becomes, well, can you actually automate this? And we've actually developed uh, within IOActive a framework that allows us to uh, generate uh, or either generate custom malware applications from a, uh, you know, just a, a skeleton application or even to inject uh, malicious behavior into existing applications. And we can do it all on the fly, just a little configuration file. That's very nice. Um, so it's, I mean, the, the development environment is, is, is really easy to develop for and it's really easy to, to modify. And so that it lends itself to, to creating these tests really quickly and, and being able to do these kinds of tests. Uh, and it's, it's easy enough that you could also probably do it. Um, so ultimately I can't say malware is all bad. I have to give something that says, what can you do about actually detecting stuff? Um, especially in terms of the bring your own device environment. So I think that security models should be absolutely explicit. And if you're actually going to be testing a device in a bring your own device environment, uh, you say this, these are the things that are allowed and anything that is not that is malware and it's bad and you cannot use it. Um, that's the only reasonable way to say that we are going to have any sort of security policy and it's gonna be able to be enforced. Um, anytime that you have something that does something that's, that, that it says that it's not doing, um, if it looks like a duck and talks like a duck, then it's a giant duck in your harbor. Um, then it's explicitly malware, so you probably want to get rid of that. Um, it gets into some interesting kind of side cases in terms of testing things where you allow X and Y, but now you have a device that, or an application that's doing X but says that it wants to do Y or says that it's doing Y. That's probably still malware just because it's a matter of intent. And then ultimately uh, validating things over and over and over again. Um, and the chalkboard is paranoid, and testing over and over and over and over again. Um, and that's pretty much it.